Last time on Graveyard Cars. So one of the nice things about being in the business where I'm at right now at this time period is so many parts are being made now for these cars that didn't used to be made. One of the most rewarding things is to spend as much time as I did with George putting this car together and know that when the roof comes down, the A-pillar holes line up exactly with the pieces in the roof. When Mark knocks on the window, we found it best to completely ignore him. This station will remain on the air on this episode. This is the car that uh, we weighed against the Hellcat a couple seasons ago. There are a lot of intricacies inside there. So to be able to work on the Daytona is a dream come true. This car will be one of the most heartwarming stories we've ever told at Great Air Cars. That coming get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. I'm a liar and a bat now. His daughter, Alyssa Rose. <laughs> Why would you do that? His painter, Will Scott. Got one job. And his cousin, Dougie. Oh, hi, Welcome back to Graveyard Cars. Yes. Yep. XP29L0G. Correct. You do? You did. You have. I'm sorry. Hang on. You had that car in your inventory. So as everyone is well aware, I have been looking for my old original high school Dodge Charger for many years since I traded it in in the late 70s. I have regretted it ever since. So I have put multiple posts on our Facebook page. I have taken out classified ads. I have given the word to everybody, including the Dodge Charger registry, to please keep an eye out for this car of mine. Recently, I decided that I would just hire a private investigator because I had a lead down in the Texas area, and that's what brings us to where we are today. So the salvage yard in San Antonio, Texas, which was just down the road from where the guy I talked to that had the car lived, did have that car in their inventory in 05. The records have been purged. They don't even have hard files more than seven years ago. That's all they're required to keep, she was saying. But she says they're pack rats, so she's gonna go out to the old files in the old trailer, storage trailer out there, and look and see if she can find out if they sold it as a complete unit or what, what happened to it. But th that's the closest we've been right there to finding the ice tray, the ice man, the ice pick, ice shavings, ice tropics. I see you, you see me. That's it, I'm on standby. So our 1969 Charger Daytona, if you may remember this vehicle, a few years ago, Tony D'Agostino came out and we debated whether or not that car was nice enough, clean enough, original enough that we wanted to try to talk the owner out of restoring it. The owner sent it to me, wanted it restored, bought the car brand new, the car's been part of his life forever, got tired of seeing it that way, sent it to us. Well, at the end of that episode, you know that I decided because the owner has spent so much time with the car in that current condition, yes, we could have done some little minor things to it and lived with it, but we decided that we would restore the car and not try to talk the owner out of it. So that brings us to where we are now. The car was completely disassembled. The body and paint has been done. The drivetrain is completely rebuilt and ready to install, which is where we're at right now. Our Charger Daytona is ready to have a headliner installed. So we're gonna take it to another upholstery shop that I've used for years, Stan's Upholstery. John does a great job. That means that vehicle has to be mobile, has to be under its own rollability. That means that we've got to install the drivetrain in it this morning. We're pretty much set up to lift this off, put it onto the install cart. We have the wheels and the tires mounted up. They're ready to go on. Our goal is to get the drivetrain installed in the car and a steering column so that we can steer it and roll it and move it around and get it over there. Now, when you're talking about the drivetrain for a Charger Daytona, there's nothing unique about this drivetrain because it's going in an XX29 NASCAR, okay? It's the exact same drivetrain that a 69 Dodge Charger RT would have. However, that car was optioned because the Charger Daytona started life as a Charger RT, plucked off the assembly line and converted over to a Daytona. So our drivetrain, engine, 
transmission, the things that go on the engine, the things that go on the transmission, the drive shaft, the rear axle assembly, front suspension and K-member, they are all 1969 Dodge Charger RT. Nothing unique that makes them NASCAR. You need to go a hair back to the driver's side. Yours or ours? Which driver's side? <laughs> the real driver's side this time. Okay. Right there. Originally now on this car, I thought because I didn't read my notes very carefully from my original conversation with the owner, back when you see us do the review of the car and the inventorying of it and the decision making, I thought that it was a numbers matching car. It's not. The transmission is original, but the original 440 HP was destroyed early on in the car's life. And so the owner put a 72 440 in it. So when it came to us, it had a 72 440 HP in it. We have since taken all of that out located him a correct date coded E440 HP engine and built it and dressed it out exactly the way that a Charger Daytona should look if you're doing it OEM correct. So they're putting the K-member bolts in right now. That fastens the K-member to the frame rails. And one of the things you want to do, which they did, is to make sure those thread holes are clean. So they run a chaser, a thread chaser. They grease the bolt so it goes in real nice and easy. When they're done tightening that down, they'll put the cross member in the transmission that holds it to the torsion bar cross member. At that point, we can raise the car up and start marrying all the stuff together, like the control arms, upper control arms, put the torsion bars in, stuff like that. You know, one of the things I get asked a lot is, what would have been the right answer from a financial standpoint on restoring a car or not restoring it? Because you hear the word survivor a lot. This car's a survivor, this car's a survivor. And a lot of people will deem something a survivor, a self-appointed survivor car, when really all it means is it hasn't been restored, but it needs to be restored. A true survivor car is a car that doesn't need to be restored, but looks like a new car or very close to it with some minor, minor over the year changes. You might have a radiator hose that's been changed out and some stuff, but that's a true survivor. This car was in the middle somewhere, but having the wrong engine in it, uh, we established that it had had some paint work done to it, that the interior was actually a little more rough. It needed a seat, a driver's seat, passenger seat was worn down, headrests starting to show some age to them, dasters showing age. Really the answer at that point was this car needed to be restored. However, from a financial standpoint, I think that the owner, who keep in mind bought this car brand new, financially, he could have sold the car for probably as much money in that condition as he could now that it's been restored. So financially, yeah, he's out X amount of money for the restoration. He's no further ahead financially, but it isn't about the finances always. You're talking about an owner who bought the car new. You're talking about an owner who spent his entire life with the car. The car is worth more emotionally. And the fact is he's seen it in that condition for so many years. He's seen it with the worn paint. He's seen it with the worn wheels and tires. He's seen it with the worn interior. He wants it new again. So how do you put a price on that? It's like the old commercial, it's priceless. He needs to see the car new, that's what we do. Not at all. I do stuff like that. I do what I want when I want. Everybody knows I like to have a little bit of fun, all right? There's nothing wrong with having a little bit of fun. You hear that? I just built this mini bike. You guys keep working. I want to ride a mini bike around the shop. I ride a mini bike around the shop. You know, what about that question? For me, the funnest thing I was able to do was talk with the owner a while back and say, what do you want to do on these ridiculous meats that you put on this car? These, I think they were an M or an L50 14 in the back and some little hokey thing in the front. They were a five slot mag. They were probably, they're broken. I can't use them, but I think they were Anson mags, old school ones. But he said, if somebody's making them, and you can get me a polished aluminum five slot, you can go with the whitest tire you'd like. So I made the decision to go with the American Racing five slot wheel, 15.8 in the back, 15.7 in the front, and the back's gonna get a 275-60 R15. I, know I just it, wanted to point out how these are my favorite tires right here. Oh yeah. BF Goodrich, radial TA. Yep. My favorite tires. The ones your daddy bought you when you were a kid. Yep. I bought okay, them. you want to go pop those out real quick? So the guys did a great job installing the drivetrain. Like I say, we've done quite a few of these, so it's not a big deal. So right now, 
The car has the drivetrain installed, the wheels and tires are on it. Justin will put the steering column in it just so we can steer it. It needs to steer. It doesn't need to brake. It needs to steer and roll. Because uh, like I said, we have to take it over and replace it with the Super B that's at Stan's upholstery right now. So it gets the headliner put in, it comes back over here and we're ready to do the final assembly. Now that our Daytona has the headliner in it and it's back to the shop, Justin and Alyssa are gonna install the sound deadening material. This is the car that uh, we weighed against the Hellcat a couple seasons ago. I remember seeing that before I even started working here. So that's kind of cool and now you're... to be working on this car. Yeah. That's full circle, that's crazy. Right. Oh yeah. So when you watch that episode, do you remember how Tony didn't want to restore this car? Because yes. it was an all original Survivor car? Yeah, Tony wanted this completely original, not restored. And my dad um, wanted to butcher it. Yeah. Well, not really. Yeah. I think it was a good choice to go ahead and restore this car just because it has the original owner. So oh, the yeah. owner was used to seeing it in that condition and right, they really right. wanted to see it brand new again. So I think in that case, all jokes aside, my dad made the right call to restore it. Yeah. Now when you're talking about these old cars, uh, our 69 Charger Daytona, there's a lot of sheet metal there. It's And it's a lot of double skin sheet metal. So in the situation of a door, you got the outer skin plus you have the inner reinforcement. Those tend to resonate when you get a good vibration, a good harmonic going in the car. You add that door and the right hand door and then the floor that has areas that can resonate and it's all just magnifying the sound from outside the car. That's why we're doing the sound deadener now. Number one, it was requested by the owner. So keep that in mind. Yes, it's not OEM, but this makes a car so much better driver. When you add that stuff to the doors, the insides of the doors, the insides of the quarters, the main floor, the under seat pan. You can put the sound deadener everywhere in the car, in my opinion, except where you see it. So you wouldn't want it on the insides of the quarter panels. That's fine. You wouldn't want it on the wheelhouses where you can see it. But if it's hidden, put it on there. In this case, we've got Justin and Alyssa working together who have really become a sharp team. So maybe I can just get Alyssa out here to help me with all of them. <laughs> no, I don't mind helping. Too far? Too no, far? No, I can help. I'll help. No problem. It's really a pretty easy job, so it was a great thing for me to jump back into the assembly room and do, and work with Justin, too, because we've never worked together. So it's really fun to work with someone who also has similar interests. You also have young kids. Yeah, everything went smooth. Alyssa did an amazing job. She just kind of mimicked what I did on the other side, so couldn't ask for a better partner to help out with this. It's nice to see that Alyssa can jump from working with Doug on an engine over to working with Justin, down to the body shop with me, up into the parts room, down back down to quality control, and she's still great with customers out front. And I think it's really cool that he saw this car in the episodes back when he just watched the show. Uh, when they took this car to the way station with the Hellcat and kind of just did that shootout against these cars, you know, I was watching this episode with my father-in-law, who's now passed. So just being able to work on this car, seeing it on TV, you know, just sitting on the couch. And then now being here working on the car, it's just so cool. So at the end of the day, we are installing a non-OEM product in a very OEM car, but it's a good addition to it. And it's also blessed by the owner. In 1971, Dodge introduced the Demon, built on the A-body platform. It was available with a slant six, 318, and the high revving, high horsepower 340. Standard transmission was a three-speed manual. Optional was the four-speed and the automatic transmission. True or false, 1971 was not only the first year for the Dodge Demon, it was also the last year for the Dodge Demon. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break, I'll let you know. Welcome back, my ghoulish friends. How did we do on that one? We know that the Dodge Demon was introduced in 1971. That was not a lie, that was the truth. True or false, 1971 was also the last year for the Dodge Demon. If you guess true, you are wrong. Not by a mile, but wrong is wrong. 1972 was the last year for the Dodge Demon. Introduced in 71, went bye-bye at the end of 72. If you want to talk about the rarest of the A bodies, 340 four speed, one of 2051. What makes it even rarer than that? It's a 346 pack. Wait a minute. 
Mopar never put a multi-hauley carburetor setup on an A-body. No, but Mr. Norm did. We are getting ready to start the disassembly of a 1968 Dodge Dart. This is a very special car, not just because it's 68 Dart. Our A-body fans will love that. But the story behind the car and the uniqueness of the car. So it's, it's important that I do the car and the family justice. So in the winter of 1968, Mr. and Mrs. Stanley walked into Wolfinger Dodge City, the local dealership, and they were looking for a Dodge Dart GTS. So at the time, the things that were really important to her when it came to ordering this car were the color combinations, as well as the 340, the manual four-speed transmission, and manual steering and manual brakes. So the Dodge Dart convertible was available for several years before 1968. 67 was a very similar looking car. However, in 1967, the shoulder belts were not out. They weren't even offered as an option. So a 67 Dodge Dart convertible wouldn't have had shoulder belts. They were optional in 1968, but so new and so different that it's a strange shoulder belt. It's about eight feet long. It goes all the way back to the B pillar and runs across the shoulder down into the lap. And if you look at this thing, it's an enormously long shoulder belt. But for the Department of Transportation, it worked. Additionally, she wanted headrests because she had read that those were available now. This is the introductory year for them. They became mandatory in mid-year 69. But in 1968, if you wanted headrests, you had to order them. Besides all that, her most important thing was it was a blue car. So she ordered it in blue with blue interior a black top, and a white bumblebee stripe. When they walked into the showroom, the car they specifically wanted with the features they specifically wanted were not available on any of the cars in there. So typically, even today, a car dealership, they have inventory that they just order that they think is going to sell well. That's a car you say is inventoried on the lot or on the showroom. When it's not available in any of those packages, and it's specific like this one where they want shoulder seat belts, specific colors. They want a 340 with a four-speed manual steering, manual drum brakes. You have to special order it. You sit down with the salesman and you go through that option book and you say, I want this, I don't want that, I do want this, I don't want that. And at the end, all of that adds up to a certain number. You flop your cash down, they order the car for you. And that's what these folks did. They special ordered a 1968 Dodge Dart GTS convertible, 344 speed. And that is what we're getting ready to work on now. Now, this is funny. It's Mrs. Stanley that actually drag raced that car. That's right. For many, many years, she was a drag racer in it, which now makes sense why she wanted manual steering and manual brakes. Less weight, go fast, save a little bit of money at the same time. But when we talk about these cars being part of our lives and part of our heritage, I mean, she has race slips from when she used to go drag racing. I have got pictures of that car in the snow up to the windshield. I have pictures of their children sitting in the car. When I talk about the fabric of our lives, these cars being it, that car meant something from the minute they picked it up, the day it was done, until 1982, when the car was sold and disappeared. So when you're talking about 1982, you're talking about the United States was in a recession. Times were tough. They had children, they had family to feed. It, they needed to sell the car. It was just, it's one of the most common stories that you will hear with people who no longer have their original cars. Life got in the way and it did for them. So in 1982, they had to sell their beloved possession. So over the next 30 plus years, of course, no more did they get rid of it and they were missing it. And we're in a position to be able to get it back. But unfortunately, they only saw the car one time in their little town after that. And they looked really avidly for it too. They'd take out classified ads, they'd talk to everybody. If you ever see this dart, we're looking for it. But unfortunately, it just seemed to have disappeared off the face of the earth. All right, so you fast forward now to 2017. Mr. and Mrs. Stanley's son, Jack, he's driving along on this country road. He looks up, he sees something kind of catches his attention. And he can see that there's just a ton of woods and debris, but there are some cars up in there. And he takes a minute and his eyes have to focus. It's mom's 1968 Dodge Star GTS convertible. Right there in the woods with trees down around it, brush all over the place, crushed from the trees, spent decades out there naked in, in the elements, is the car. The 68 Dodge Dart that they special ordered from Wolfinger Dodge in 1967. 
It's unbelievable. Here is the car. That's not even what he went up there for. He just thought maybe he'd find, you know, an old Ford truck or something. He could make a buck flipping. And there it was. So once he realizes what this car is, he gets, he gets closer, he confirms it. And this is really where the emotions for that family started. He went back and got mom and dad, brought them out there, and mom couldn't believe it. Dad couldn't believe it. First thing she did was ran up to that car and hugged it, <laughs> which I would do too if I found my old Charger. I know it's an inanimate object, but there's a lot of memories in that car. And they pulled all the trees and the limbs and the brush and they dug it out and they loaded it on a car trailer. Next thing you know, it's kind of a complete car setting in their driveway. That's when the real story of the Stanley Dodge Dart begins. So finally, with all the body and paint work done on our 69 Charger Daytona, we can move the nose cone in for disassembly. Justin's gonna begin with a teardown, restore all the parts, and then reassemble it. When you're talking about these nose cones for the Superbird and for the Daytona Charger, there are a lot of intricacies inside there. I got that seal out of the way, and what I'm gonna start doing is taking pictures all the way down here and all this, this, this top filler plate. When I go to reassemble this whole nose cone, I know exactly where things were placed and how they were and what bolts were actually used. What's cool about Justin working on this one is he grew up with his dad building aftermarket nose cones and wings for these cars. He's been very exposed to the uh, replica or tribute world. There we go, we got the filler plate off. I think I was probably born in a Daytona. So to be able to work on the Daytona is a dream come true. You know, being born into a family that has been building these type of cars. You know, you grow up around them and you just, you begin to have that just undying appreciation for it. I grew up around these cars, go to car shows with my dad. If he needed help, you know, polishing the car, that's the first thing I would do. I'd grab a rag, I'd grab the spray, start polishing, cleaning wheels. Anytime I ever could, I'd just be out there with my dad when he was building his Daytonas, handing him screwdrivers, wrenches. And, you know, now I have my son. You know, when he gets old enough, teach him all the same things that my dad taught me. It's just very special. So now when it comes to the disassembly, he can see everything that the factory did. The Z brackets, the running lamps in the front, what they are originally, the wiring harnesses and how they're routed, the bolts, the seals, the rivets that hold the seals in place, the pivot points for the headlight buckets, what the headlight buckets are made out of, the very unique grill insert piece, the lower deflector, the latch tray. This is an awesome opportunity for him to take his time, photograph and inventory everything that's in there so that we can put it back exactly the way the manufacturer did back in the day. In 1968, Mr. and Mrs. Stanley walked into their local Dodge dealer and ordered this car. So the reason we are talking about this car right now is we're about to start the restoration. And it's one of the toughest cars we've ever done. It's also one of the rarest. So 1968 was the introductory year for the Scat Pack. That was Dodge's way of saying, we're all in on this horsepower thing. We came up with a cool little group called the Scat Pack, and the Dodge Dart was one of those. This was revolutionary. This was saying, we're all in, our hat's in the ring, we are building muscle cars, and if you're part of the Scat Pack, you're cool because you got a fast car. And so that really resonated with a lot of people. Regardless of the number of colors, regardless of if it had power steering, power brakes, whatever it is, the fact that it's a 68 Dodge Dart GTS 344 speed make it one of only 44. So let's just talk about how cool the car is on its own merit. So in 1968, the Dodge Dart GTS was standard with the 340 and optional with the 383 big block in an A-body, this is really cool. They actually did it in 67, carried it into 68 when they made the GTS. Now, if you wanted a Hemi in one of those cars, first off, you had to be approved by Chrysler to get one. Chrysler only built 80 of these. They are a factory super stock dart. We got to go out and put one through the tests at Brett Torino's place down in Las Vegas. He had a 68 real live super stock dart 
These cars had a 426 Hemi with the cross ram dual four intake manifold. If you look at the street Hemi, which is what we work on here all the time, the carburetors, one in the front, one in the back, it's called an inline dual four. If you go back to 1965, they had the cross ram race Hemi. They were staggered like this. That complete setup actually went into hibernation until 1968 and brought back out for the 68 super stock dart Barracuda. There were no window regulators. They didn't roll up and down. They wanted to save the weight, so they just used a strap in there to hold the window down or to hold it up. Additionally, the hood and the fenders were made of fiberglass. But I gotta start with the first thing, which is inventory in the car and its condition and validating it. That's what we're gonna do now. Dodge actually used some of the original components from other cars. The park lamps, they're actually from a 69 Valiant. And you can see that right on the lens. It says 69V, and the V stood for, you know, Valiant, like, a, like X stood for the model of the Chargers. So the paint on these headlight doors are actually peeling. You know, they're weathered. They're really, I mean, it's from 1969, so it's like 40 plus years old. You know, if overspray got somewhere, it is what it is, they left it. One of the neat things about the Daytona is it is very original. If you look at the, I think it was the left-hand headlight bucket, it still had the part number stamped on the side of it. So we're documenting that so that when it's completely done, we can duplicate that part number. Even though you'll probably never see it in a million years, that's what we want to do here at Graveyard Cars. Because if somebody were to crawl up its butt with a microscope, or what was it Eddie Murphy said in uh, Beverly Hills Cop? He was pretending he was a federal agent, and he said, I'm gonna get 100 federal agents, come down here and call up your ass with a flashlight. <clears throat> Can you say ass? So the disassembly of the nose cone went really smooth. I was able to get everything torn apart, and uh, we're gonna lay everything out just to make sure everything gets labeled right and put back in the correct spot. Axel Foley. <laughs> I'm back. Later, he did say Gondar, actually. Eddie Murphy, right? You can base your whole life around Eddie Murphy's little one-liners. So the car's been here for a couple of years. Uh, we inventoried it, filmed it. I've gotten all the backstory and history on it. It's time now to inspect the car, make sure everything is the way it's supposed to be. So the very first thing I'll do is clean off the fender tag, take a look at the codes on it, make sure they match what the owner told me this car had. LS27 is the Dodge Dart convertible GTS. 52 is the tire size. Three represents that it's a four-speed manual transmission. 207 is the scheduled production date, February 7th, 1968. And this is the shipping order number down here. It's this shipping order number that matches the radiator support, or should, and the trunk lip. It does not match the title or the vehicle identification number. Now, in 1968, they did not put the vehicle identification numbers on the fender tag. They used shipping order numbers. In 69, they use vehicle identification numbers, but in 68 and prior, it's shipping order numbers. So here we have Brait Bravo 8 Lima 164917, 164917. So those match. That radiator support started life with that fender tag, and you can tell that it's all blue. If this is all factory blue, all this evidence here, this is good stuff. It all supports it as well. So now we have the fender tag, we have the radiator support, and we have the body colors to match. So that's all good stuff. This decal, if I can get the paint off of it in the key area, which is the left upper corner, will tell me a part number. That part number will coincide with the correct decal for the car. So for example, a 1968 340, would have a certain emission decal on it. I'm looking for that number right now. Beautiful, still in good shape under here. Let me get, right there's the number. Let me clean that off the rest of the way. 2899845. That is the part number for an emission label for a 1968 340 four barrel engine. So remember, Chrysler put two hidden body numbers on most of their cars, on the Dodge Dart, as on most of them except for the E-Body. They put the last eight characters of the shipping order number stamped into the trunk lip underneath here, which is where the weather strip goes. So I gotta clean that off. Looks like they've already sanded on this before. And there it is, 
Bravo 8164917. So this trunk lip, which is blue, QQ1 blue, which matches the original paint quarters, which matches the original paint firewall, which matches the fender tag and the upper cowl panel and the upper radiator support, all tell me this car is a real live 1968 Dodge Dart GTS 340 four speed. Now, some of the other cool detailing points that we wanna get. Here you can see the remnants of what's left of the bumblebee stripe. You'll see how it's cut down here, right where they cut them at the factory. They didn't let them hang all the way over. If you buy your graphics, like we get ours from Phoenix Graphics, they come a little long. You have to figure out where you're gonna cut them. We always try to cut them exactly where the factory did if we have evidence of it. Well, now we have evidence of it. Here you can see the original white stripe as it fades out, starts to show the original primer underneath it. Little signs of the adhesive still left on there. That bumblebee also started life on this car. So here you can see the entire trunk floor is completely rotted out, everything. Go over here, there's nothing left. A little piece of the extension right there, holes in the floor, holes in the rear body panel. Up there, the under seat pan that goes all the way under the seat and back to the trunk's completely gone, just rotted out through there. All that's garbage. Trunk lip, the gutter, completely rotted out. If you look around there and all the way over to the other side, it's all rotted out. So that won't be usable, but this piece will be usable. So if we just take this at the spot welds right here, take it loose from the bottom gutter, put a new bottom gutter on this section, we still have a convertible top opening, which they don't make. They don't make the Dutchman panel for a convertible and they don't make a convertible quarter panel. So in this particular case, we'll save this section and graft it onto the new quarter panels. You look inside the car, it's just a mess. Everything from one end to the other. You start at the under seat pan, the frame rail, frame rail extension over the inner rocker, rear step wells, the main floor, the tunnel's destroyed, everything is rotten on this car. But this is a key area that we can save, that we have to save. They don't reproduce it. It's unique to a convertible. We have to save this. The tops of these wheelhouses, we have to save them. And they're in good shape. The rear support bar, beautiful shape. All that can be saved, cleaned up, added pieces to it, and put back in the car as we go together with it. So now you have a dash vehicle identification number, which we have, a fender tag. The fender tag matches the DNA that you're looking at on the car. The radiator support matches, the trunk lip matches. We now have a body numbers matching 68 Dart 344 speed convertible. Done, this car will be one of the most stunning little A-bodies at any show on the planet. But it'll also be one of the most heartwarming stories we've ever told at Graveyard Cars. The 1971 Dodge Demon was certainly a cool car, especially one like this, a 340 and a four-speed Hemi Orange. I mean, that's just about the neatest A-body made. However, no part of the body of this car was really designed to be just a Dodge Demon. The quarter panels, in fact, the entire body shell back, including the roof, is a Plymouth Duster. The fenders and the hood are off of another car. What car donated its body parts so that this car could become a real live demon. Was it Cornette, Charger, Challenger? I think you know the answer. Stay tuned after the break and we'll find out together. So you're telling us Mark is just a mannequin You've been controlling him the whole time, and you've been faking blindness. Actually, that makes sense. Dougie's never been blind. I don't know why I didn't pick up on that sooner. You got me. I planned this entire dinner party. I designed a dummy mark. Wait, so the dead butler in the kitchen? Yes, I designed that one too. And I spent months modifying and booby trapping this mansion. Of course, I didn't do it all on my own. I had help from two of Mark's most trusted employees. No, Will? How could you? Hey, this wasn't my choice. I was blackmailed. He said he'd expose me for being the number two painter. But according to my Instagram, number underscore one underscore painter, I'm the number one painter. Okay, I admit it. It's been me, George, this whole time. We built the mannequins and installed the bars. I came in disguise so I wouldn't be found out. Dude, you're an idiot. I told you, you weren't fooling anybody. Let me tell you something, fella. You just made a huge mistake confessing all this to a well-known private investigator and his partner. 
murder, identity theft, blackmail. You're going away for a long time. Tony, have Mr. Oldham unlock the door as he will be escorting us to the nearest police station. I don't think I'll do that, Stan. What's this all about? Come on, Stan, what kind of detective are you? You didn't really think I was working for you this whole time, did you? Dougie, you did good. Everything went according to plan. Thank you, sir. That's right. None of you suspected a thing, did you? No one ever has. I've been, been trying, trying to get, get rid, rid of the Mark for years. Now I've finally done it. That's right. I killed Mark. Me. Royal Yoakum. Oh my god, Royal? Why would you kill my dad? I mean, besides the obvious reasons. For this, of course. My dad's Mopar award that he was given at SEMA? Why would you even want that? It's a freaking paperweight. Oh, is it? Welcome back. How did we do on that trivia question of the little eight bodies? The fenders and the hood are off of a Dodge product, while the body itself is a Plymouth Duster. What Dodge product donated its fenders and hood for this car to come to life? Was it Coronet, Charger, Challenger? If you guess Coronet, well, frankly, if you guess Coronet, Charger, or Challenger, you're wrong all the way around. That is a trick question. It's actually a Dodge Dart. The only other A body that would be available that would fit on this platform. We have a Plymouth Duster body dressed with Dodge Dart fenders and hoods. And grill too, if you want to get the technical. Okay, so tomorrow, our 1971 Plymouth Cuda 340 three speed, one of 13. Eight ever built, leaves to go home finally. Next time you should like let me know. Well, <laughs> you should do your research. Just saying. Our 1971 in violet CUDA convertible 343 speed was done last season. Number one, we're in Oregon. So just because a car is done and we can show it inside, you'll notice if you go back to the footage, we weren't out driving it around because it was a monsoon outside. While the rain and the sleet and the hail was going on here in the winter at Graveyard Cars, is Alyssa's job is to QC everything. Just because we say it's done on TV doesn't necessarily mean it's ready to be shipped to the customer. Alyssa and I were able to take the car out and go for a really nice road test. Her job has been to make sure that, down to every conceivable detail, that the car is right cosmetically and to the best of her ability, mechanically. Car uh, feels good. Everything feels yeah. right about it. I like it. How the brakes, brakes feel good. It's a manual Clutch. drum brake. They're tough. You really got to press on those things. But you have to road test these cars. They have to be out on the road. You got to go over railroad tracks. You gotta go weave in and out of a, uh, the shoulder to hear squeaks and rattles and bumps. You gotta go over speed bumps. You gotta hear things. You gotta make sure that the car is really ready to hand back to the owner. That's what we're doing now. It's fun for me to be able to drive around with my daughter in a one of eight car and let her experience some of the things, the feel, the feel of a car. She hasn't got to drive a convertible uh, by herself yet. I ain't never gonna die. <laughs> well, uh, someday. Yeah, well, not really. This thing drives nice. Real nice. It sounds like it. Just a little bit of stumbling on the acceleration. I have to set the timing in the secondaries, and then it's done. Can we write that in a note? Yeah, timing and secondaries. My mom taught me how to drive a clutch because she has more patience than my dad. An easy driver. One thing is it's a three-speed instead of a four-speed, so it's a lot less shifting. It's a lot easier maintenance. This is a good combination right here. There's nothing wrong with that three-speed. It was neat that she was able to get in the car and drive it. I felt very comfortable that she knew what she was doing, for the most part. So I just want to be okay. on the record. Your mother taught you to drive. You know what shift. I said. Rest my case. Woo! Yeah, woo! Now, you know, you got to be careful up here. I see what you mean with those brakes. Yeah, they're just manual drum brakes. I'll say it again. MDB, manual drum brake. MDB, manual drum brake. Now, what you gonna do here? I don't know. Oh, no. Should I go in a circle? The car drove phenomenally. 
All of the QC work that Alyssa made sure everybody dotted their I's and crossed their T's really paid off in that road test. It's important that if you turn the left turn signal on that it works and then it cancels. That's a simple little thing. Make sure that the radio works, not just inside the building, but outside the building. Make sure that all of the lights work, all of the systems work in the car. Do all the gauges work? Does the speedometer jump when you're going down the road because the cable needs to be lubricated or it's old and worn? Those are all the reasons for the road test. And this car passed every single benchmark for quality, every single one, without hesitation. This car is ready to be delivered to the owner. So with the Daytona nose cone torn apart, labeled and everything, organized, I can actually go get the wing, bring that in and take that apart. It's gonna be quick, two bolts and it's done. So years ago, when we were doing Tom Partridge's Charger Daytona, the red one with the white wing, I learned quite a bit about the functionality of it. Number one, growing up, because I didn't know, I thought that the Superbird and the Daytona used the same wing. They look very similar, but if you actually back them up next to each other and look at them, there's a considerable difference between the two. But the one thing that isn't different about it is how it functions. All they did was the top plane that goes across it. If you look at it from the side, you'll see that it has this shape to it, kind of a, a half round moon shape, and the top is flat. That's the same principle as an airplane wing, except because they want downforce on the car, they flip it over. So on a Daytona Charger, that little shape right there is on the bottom and the top is flat. If you wanted it to lift up, you just flip it over and it would cause it to lift up at high speeds. So that's kind of a cool thing. But the Daytona wing is made out of a cast aluminum, all three pieces. It uses a hex headed bolt on each side and it is adjustable. So in a real NASCAR, you'd want to adjust that around there based on, the, you go around the track a few times and maybe it's a little soft in the back and it's starting to slide out. You would adjust it for more or less down pressure. It's really a cool functional piece. Now that we have the nose cone completely disassembled and inventoried, photographed, as well as the wing, we can move it into the rest of the shop for restoration work. I am so glad that everybody gets to ride along real time for this. I mean, I, granted this is gonna air a few weeks after it's happened, but I am on standby to find out, confirm that this company, this wrecking yard down in Texas did have my old car and where it went. So I'm, I'm, I'm completely thrilled to be doing this and sharing it with all of my beloved ghouls out there in graveyard land. Hello there. Yep. Okay, lay it on me. What'd you find out? Okay. <laughs> That's amazing, because I keep all my files too. I still have detail invoices from 1985 when I started my business. I know you don't have to, but it's kind of cool. I figure someday I'll be old and gray and it'd be fun to go back and look through some of that, see where you were when you were 25 and 35. And yeah, so I'm sorry, I'm just a little bit excited. <laughs> okay. What's that mean? What is that? 